I bring greetings to you from uh, Cascades Bible Church in uh, Sterling, Virginia, and we appreciate your loaning us, Pastor Gabe, this morning, so he could come and minister to our congregation. Um, we have uh, been studying through the book of Isaiah as, uh, as a church body for the last several months, and um, it has been a rich and it has been a powerful study for us. We're, only, uh, we're not going through it verse by verse, <laughs> we're taking it in larger chunks, Um, But it has been a powerful study, and so as I think about what might benefit our souls this morning, um, my heart turned to Isaiah chapter 6. And um, I have to admit, when I started uh, planning and and looking toward preaching through this book, um, I didn't quite realize what I was getting into. (laughs) And I feel like like a little puppy with a giant bone trying to... Uh, chew on this thing. And so what we're going to do this morning is try and chew on Isaiah chapter 6. So I invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Now for those of you who are maybe not as familiar with the book of Isaiah, um, and that may be many of us this morning, it is worth pointing out, just by way of introduction and setting the context, that the opening five chapters of this book more or less uh, function as Isaiah's preface to the main body of his prophetic work. Of course, a preface in a book is is like a short introduction um, by the author. It it, it tells you why they wrote the book. It tells you what uh, they want you to know before you start reading the book. Um, A preface can also provide readers with additional context and, and background and information from the author's perspective on the work that you're about to read. And so, Uh, That's what chapters 1 to 5 function as in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is called a ministry, which we just heard read for our scripture reading this morning. And the prophetic details that follow in chapter 6 to verse, uh, chapter 66, um, those uh, those, uh, are the main body of the book. But what the situation is on the ground and why Isaiah's ministry is even necessary in the first place, that is only made clear to us as we read the introductory chapters and his comments in chapters 1 to 5. And what we see as we study through this, Isaiah is, uh, is preaching and ministering in the southern kingdom of Judah. What we see is him... Uh, Uh, accusing them of and corroborating was this reality that Judah was not what God had created them to be. The book of Isaiah is in many ways like uh, God's letter to his beloved but wayward son, showing them all the ways that they had rejected him, showing him all the ways that he had squandered uh, his spiritual privileges and failed to live up to his calling. And like a mirror, Isaiah's words here in this book remind God's people to whom they belong and also to what depths they had sunk. And even though they'd strayed completely off the reservation spiritually and practically, yet there was still an opportunity before them to turn back to their Heavenly Father. God, we know from the Old Testament uh, law, chose Israel to be a billboard to the nations. They were to be a beachhead through whom the true knowledge of God and His saving purposes was to be disseminated throughout the entire world. But as chapter 1 reveals to us in Isaiah, they were a comprehensive failure. They were not what God meant for them to be nationally. They were not what God meant for them to be spiritually. And they were not what God meant for them to be socially. In Isaiah chapter 1, we see beginning in verse 2, the, uh, the, the God, like a, a heavenly prosecutor, is making his case against his people. In chapter 1 verse 2, witnesses are called. Heaven and earth is called to witness against them. Charges are read at the end of verse 2. He says, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. And a sentence of judgment has been pronounced against them. In verse 24, he says, Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. So, stunningly, in chapter 1, 
God's infinite power is going to be turned against His enemies, and some of those enemies are within His chosen nation. A righteous judgment is coming. But even with all of their national rebellion and all of their religious hypocrisy, which he spells out in chapter 1, and all their societal corruption, yet there are echoes of mercy scattered throughout this opening chapter. In verse 18, he says, come now and let us reason together. This is legal terminology. He says, uh, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, he says, you will eat the best of the land. Verse 26, then I will restore to your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. And after that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Isaiah speaking for God says you're guilty, but here, here is what can happen. I can offer you complete forgiveness, but that forgiveness is conditional. It is conditioned upon a repentant spirit. A heart that turns back to God. He says, repent and eat the good things of the land. God will bring righteousness to them. He will bring justice to them, verse 27 says, but He will only do that to her repentant ones. So God is righteous, yes. God is jealous, yes. But God is also compassionate. He's also a God who is abounding, as the psalmist says, in loving kindness to those who call upon Him with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. As you continue on in chapter 2, through chapters 2 through 4, we see God's purpose is consummated. His purpose is consummated in judgment and His purpose is consummated in salvation. Isaiah is being carried along by the Holy Spirit to produce within Israel, within Judah, an appetite for holiness and an appetite for faith-filled obedience. He is proclaiming to them the absolute certainty of God's judgment. And when God rises up, Isaiah says, nothing that they have put their trust in in this world will be there to rescue them. You can read about it in chapters 2 and 3. And as God judges Judah and Jerusalem, the foundations of society are going to give way. And that's what you see him describing throughout chapters 3 and the beginning verse of chapter 4. But all God's impulses are not to judge. They are not to chasten. God's also meant to purify them and ultimately to accomplish His saving purposes through them. And we get a short preview of that, what that salvation will be like in these opening verses of chapter 2 and again in chapter 4. This picture we see in Isaiah 2, 2 to 4, is one in which the whole earth is like Eden once again. And the kingdom of God which had fallen in Genesis 3 has become the kingdom restored. And the Prince of Peace is reigning. Righteousness is filling the whole earth. And he describes that in vivid detail in chapters 2 and again in most of chapter 4. But as you come to chapter 5, we see God's grace consumed. God's grace consumed. In chapter 5, Isaiah ends this preface of the main body of the book with a parable. And Israel and Judah are the vineyard in this parable. And, And God is the vineyard owner and the vine dresser. And God, he says, has done a total work, but all that he has received in return is a total loss. Look at chapter 5 and verse 4. He says, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? This is a rhetorical question. He says, The only thing left that I can do is to execute justice. And how will God execute that justice? Later on in chapter 5, Beginning in verse 24, he will bring a foreign nation to come and consume them and to take them out of the land. Judah sowed to the flesh, and that faithless generation eventually reaped judgment. They reaped shame, and they reaped corruption. They were not what God meant for them to be. And there wasn't even a hint within their midst of desiring to turn back to the Lord at this time. 
And so chapter five ends, chapter five ends with the lights going out. If you look at verse 30, in the final phrase and clause of verse 30, it says, if one looks to the land, behold, there is darkness and distress. There are no flickers of light like we see in chapters one through four in chapter five. It, it, the lights have gone out. It appears as though God has closed up shop and gone home. But as Isaiah begins the opening chapter of his book in our chapter six, there lies within chapter six the promise of a new beginning. And, 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 and he is about to introduce to us in chapter 6 through 12, this Davidic king, God with us. And as we read earlier, we see this vision of Isaiah beginning in chapter 6. And from chapter 6 to 12, they form within this book a complete unit with chapter 6 in particular, almost like a bridge between the preface in 1 to 5 and this, um, this description of this Davidic king in chapter 7 through 12. And chapter 6 has one foot planted firmly in the terrifying reality of God's grace consumed. And then in chapters 7 to 12, it has one foot firmly planted in the promise of Messiah and his kingdom ushering in salvation for the whole world. And in between those two realities, 1 to 5 and six, uh, 7 to 12, we see God's confrontation, his cleansing, and his commissioning of the prophet which tells us again and again, death does not have the final word. When we come across these introductory details as we do in the beginning part of chapter 6 and verse 1, it is easy to overlook their significance. As you study it, as you read it, um, you see him give these details and you think, okay, this is Isaiah's call and commission. So what? Now what? But what we have to understand is Isaiah, like all the prophets who share details of their call to ministry, Jeremiah does this, Ezekiel does this, as they share these, these seemingly insignificant facts, they are, they are recorded not just for history's sake, but these personal facts are communicated because they illustrate some vital theme that we need to understand that God wants us to know. And the theme of chapter 6 is that death does not have the final word. Death does not have the final word. There, there is always hope for God to act, even when it seems like the lights have all gone out. Amen. And what we see here as we break the text down into manageable parts is really in verses 1 to 5, we see Isaiah, uh, Isaiah's confrontation with the holiness of God. In verses 6 to 7, we'll see his cleansing and then in verses 8 to 13, we will see his commission. And so I want to begin our, our study through this chapter in the time that we have remaining by looking in verses 1 to 5, and we see Isaiah's confrontation with the holiness of God. He says in, in verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah's death. Let's stop right there for just a moment. As you read um, the Old Testament narratives, uh, Kings and Chronicles and First uh, First Kings chapter fifteen and in uh, Second Chronicles chapter twenty six, you'll know that King Uzziah, who's also called Azariah, reigned for fifty two years over his, over Judah, and he presided over a period of relative prosperity, uh, of relative uh, peace in the southern kingdom, and and by the end of his life, however the Assyrian king, Tiglath-Pileser III, had risen to power, and he had ambitions, ambitions to conquer, ambitions to expand the Assyrian empire, which, of course, stirs the pot throughout all the ancient Near Eastern world, for Israel and for Judah, for, for sure, because they're so small, but also Damascus in the north and Egypt in the south. And what made Uzziah's death even maybe more significant in Judah's history is that as his reign ended, he stumbled past the finish line. As Kings and Chronicles tells us, he arrogantly violated God's command and entered the temple himself of his own accord to burn incense before the Lord, even though that was strictly forbidden under the law. And God struck him 
it says, with a skin disease, forcing him to spend the rest of his days in ritual uncleanness, in quarantine, estranged and alienated. And his son Jotham reigned in his place. And so this King Uzziah, this symbol of the nation, which is what the king is, this symbol of the nation was a man under God's judgment. He's overseeing a people who are increasingly revolting against God's covenant. And and he's staring down the prospect of an unstoppable imperialistic force in Assyria. And then this king, who's been on the throne for over half a century, dies. And the question is raised amongst the people. At least it had to have been raised amongst the people. Has the Lord come to the end of his proverbial rope? Has the Lord come to the end of his proverbial rope? Because it looks bleak. It looks bleak externally. It looks bleak internally, nationally, spiritually, socially. It's dark. And and it's here. It's here that Isaiah timestamps his call to prophetic ministry. It is with a death in the darkness that God confronts Isaiah with a vision of himself. Look at verse 1. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. As John chapter 1, verse 18 teaches us, God is spirit, and there is no one who is able to see God in his essence. But occasionally, God will accommodate man's creatureliness and make himself visible for the, for the benefit of his servants. And that's possibly what we see God doing here in, in Isaiah chapter 6. It's also possible and more likely, I think, that this is a visionary experience and not something that Isaiah would have seen with his physical eyes, but would have been made known to him by supernatural revelation. And uh, I believe that's the case because it seems from John chapter 12 that what Isaiah saw was a vision of God the Son because in John chapter 12 in verses 39 to 41, John quotes chapter 6 verse 10 from our text this morning and then adds this comment, Isaiah said this, because he, Isaiah, saw Jesus' glory and he spoke of him. So, uh, most likely, Isaiah is describing here in chapter 6 this vision of God the Son, pre-incarnate Son, and in this vision, the Son is on a throne and he is lofty and he is exalted. Those two terms are very significant because later on in Isaiah chapter 52, These terms, lofty and exalted, are ascribed to the Lord's servant. Further underscoring again, I think this is a vision of Messiah. And in the year that the earthly king, Uzziah, dies, Isaiah receives a vision of the real king. The king of kings, who stands behind and over all earthly kings, and he tells us the train of his robe was filling the temple. The temple was the earthly location where God's manifest presence was made known to the people. And it's where God's presence was placed on earth in the temple. It's where God's transcendent glory was made known to man in a special way. And so it was also the temple was the center, at least it was meant to be, the center of the people's lives. And that is where he sees this vision of God. But he doesn't just see the Lord and and glory filling the temple. He sees seraphim standing in the Lord's presence. Look at verse 2. He says, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Now seraphs, literally burning ones, are only mentioned here. They're heavenly beings. They're described with human-like bodies but human-like bodies that have six wings. And says they have two wings that covered their faces, most likely so as not to look directly in, at the divine glory. No, With two, they covered their feet, possibly signifying they were not choosing their own path. Because, again, all throughout the Scriptures, the feet are associated with the direction of one's life. And he says, with two, they flew. Because... 
They were likely servants waiting upon the exalted Lord for direction and service. And fire, fire is the primary visible symbol of God's holiness that we see in the Old Testament. In, for example, in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses turns aside to see the angel of the Lord, what does he see? A burning bush. Later on, as the people come out of the land and they are before Mount Sinai, the, I, Exodus chapter 19 describes smoke and fire and lightning and the earth quaking. Again, fire connected with the symbol of God's holiness. And so you, you have in, in this vision these burning ones with fiery wings covering their faces and their feet and, and two more wings helping them fly around. And so the scene is one of giant flames surrounding the Holy One. And as these flaming servants wait upon the Lord, it is interesting to note what they're doing. Verse 3 says, And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Just like the creatures that you read in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, the seraphim, their anthem, has a singular theme. And that theme is the holiness of God. In Hebrew, one of the ways that you express a superlative, like pure gold, is by repetition. Some of you may be familiar with this. So instead of attaching an adjective to it like we would in English to say pure gold, in, in Hebrew you would say gold, gold. In fact, you see that in 2 Kings chapter 25. Or if you wanted to say the land is full of tar pits like uh, Genesis records for us, like Moses records in Genesis 14, you say pits, pits. But here... We see the only example in the scriptures of a quality or object rage, raised to the power of three. As R.C. Sproul has famously, famously said in one of his well-known sermons on this text, God is not just holy. He's not just holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. Which is to say God's holiness outstrips anything the human mind can possibly comprehend. That we basically need to make up superlatives to describe the holiness of God. And, and His holiness, what does that mean? Well, it, it speaks of His separateness, and it also speaks of His ethical purity. God is utterly transcendent. He is utterly he is wholly other from us as his creatures and his creation. But not only that, God is pure. There, there's no contamination or mixture of sin in God. He is unapproachably holy, 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 and that is the standard he requires of us. There's a whole niche market of books out there written by people who purport to have died and gone to heaven and come back again. And they always talk about their vision of God or Jesus, whoever they come in contact with, like he's this friendly, grandfatherly figure. Or, or they'll speak about him as um, this dynamic version of like a Renaissance painting or something. But when Isaiah received a vision of the Lord, it was utterly terrifying. When Ezekiel describes his vision of the Lord in Ezekiel chapter 1, and you've got wheels within wheels and four faces and everything's moving around without turning, it's terrifying. When the Israelites in Exodus saw God's presence on Mount Sinai, it was terrifying. And when John is carried up to the heaven and he saw the risen Savior in Revelation, it was terrifying. He fell at his feet like a dead man. The triune God is utterly holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah is confronted with that vision, listen to what he says in verses 4 and 5. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The effect of this revelation of God's holiness shakes the foundations of the temple. It's so majestic. It is so powerful. It is so utterly consuming that it seems like the entire place is going to crash in on him. And just the mention of God's holiness is enough to bar Isaiah's entrance into God's presence. That's why we see him describing smoke filling up the temple to obscure his vision. He is so utterly terrified and overwhelmed with this vision of God's holiness that he cries out, Woe is me, for I am ruined. This term ruined has the has the idea, speaks of a silence brought about by a loss or a death. Just so consumed with grief, you can't speak. Isaiah, Isaiah realizes he has no part to sing in this heavenly choir of God's holiness. He's a wretched sinner. He dwells amongst a nation, a nation of wretched sinners. He is not separate. He is not pure. He only receives a glimpse of the King, the Lord of hosts, and he understands that he is under a sentence of death. He is a dead man walking. This, this is what we need to understand about God. This is what we need to preach when we preach the character of God. God is not the big man upstairs. He's not your buddy. He's not your butler waiting around to fulfill all your selfish desires. He is holy, holy, holy. And when He reveals Himself, the foundations tremble and His creatures fall down like dead men at His feet. And the only words they can get out is, Woe is me, for I am ruined. That brings us Secondly, to Isaiah's cleansing, which we see in verses 6 and 7. Isaiah's been confronted with this terrifying vision of God's holiness. Smoke has filled the temple. The foundations are shaking. He's pronounced judgment upon himself. All that remains in view in verse 6 is fire and an altar. Look at verse 6. He says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. The question that had to be resonating through his mind is this. Is God going to consume me? Is God going to consume me? In the Old Testament, fire is most often associated with God's consuming holiness. He is a consuming what? Fire. Genesis 3, verse 24, as as Adam and Eve are banished from the garden, they are not able to return, and God stations an angel at the entrance to the garden with what? A flaming, fiery sword that moves every which direction. In Numbers chapter 11, in verses 1 to 3, when God's judgment breaks loose in the camp, it breaks loose with fiery judgment. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, in verses 12 and 36 and 33, 33, 33 and 36, Moses recalls God's fiery presence before the people at Mount Sinai as they pleaded with God not to speak with them directly. When you think fire, at least the Israelites, when they thought fire, they thought judgment. So when Isaiah sees fire and then he's already seen and been confronted with God's holiness, and then he sees these burning ones with six wings flying around singing a song about God's holiness, he's got to be a little more nervous. But this is fire from an altar. The seraphs flies to Isaiah with a coal taken from this altar where, presumably, the text doesn't say it, but it's assumed a substitutionary sacrifice has been made. The altar is the place where, by the death of a substitute, sin is atoned for. The altar was the place where 
where God's holiness is satisfied. And so this, this burning coal signifies not destruction, but remarkably signifies God's gracious cleansing and purification. And of course, that is made abundantly clear to us in verse 7. It says, He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. There is this declaration, you have been made clean. He tells him, you've been made clean. God's sacrifice has cleansed his lips. And yes, but God's sacrifice has also cleansed his inner person. He, he's taken away his, his guilt. He has taken away his iniquity. And how has this come to be? How has this taken place? By atonement. A satisfactory payment which is what atonement implies. It's satisfactory payment has been debt, has been paid. His debt has been covered. The Old Testament teaches that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Leviticus 17, verse 11, it's reiterated to us in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 9. That principle has been upheld in this text. And the guilty prophet has been purified so that he can become a useful messenger of God's word to his people. And this cleansing that we see in verses 6 and 7 gives way in verses 8 to 13 to the Lord's commission. The Lord's commission. The immediate impact of this cleansing is reconciliation. Look at verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Before Isaiah saw the Lord at a distance. Right? In verses 1-5, to five, he, his vision of God is obscured by the smoke. But now he's hearing the Lord plainly. Before, he was so terrified that the only words he could get out of his mouth were, Woe is me. And now... What does he see him doing? Speaking freely. Before, God's blazing holiness was obscured and the smoke had consumed everything. And yet now, in verse 8, Isaiah stands in the Lord's presence. And God has brought him in in order to send him out. That's his purpose. So what are we to make of this plural pronoun, us, in verse 8. Who will go for us? Well, God is clearly in consultation here. Let's read the text. He's, he's in consultation. The question is, with whom? And uh, some commentators and some Bible scholars say, well, he must be coordinating and communicating consultation with the seraphs. Or maybe he's speaking to the angels. But really, there's no evidence in Scripture that God is in consultation with angels about anything. And, um, but as you read this text, it certainly sounds a lot like Genesis 1, doesn't it? Genesis 1, verse 26. And of course, it wasn't until later revelation is given to us in the New Testament that the Apostle John, and again, the physician Luke, writes in, in both John and and in Acts, we learn that this text, these words, are related both to the Lord Jesus in John chapter 12 and verse 41, and the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 28 and verse 25. And so, as we read this, I think this is a clear indication that, um, that, that God's triune nature is in view. This is a the, the rumblings of triunity are here, and the full picture, of course, is, is given to us in, great, in greater detail as we come to the New Testament. And so we see the, the triune God um, kind of self-disclosing in this revelation. And it's worth noting that what had once terrified Isaiah now motivates him to offer himself willingly. He says, here I am. Send me. This is what God's cleansing work does, doesn't it? 
It takes us from woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and takes us and turns us, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He has been cleansed of his sin by God's gracious and atoning work. And now he was being turned loose to live for and to serve God. And God has a special and a difficult ask for him in verses 9 to 11. He says, uh, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. What we see here is that God is going to use Isaiah to deafen the ears and blind the eyes of, he says, this people. Not my people, this people. Isaiah's commission is one of making the deaf, deafer, is that a word? I don't know. He's going to make the blind, blinder. As he goes out and he preaches a message of repentance and judgment to Judah and even to the northern tribes in Israel. God can still and will still offer repentance as an option, but and some individuals still may turn, but God's judgment as a whole for this nation has been sealed up at this point. What is coming will come. And even though Isaiah is going to explain God's truth with such simplicity, as you get into the later chapters, that um, some of his critics will accuse him of, of he should saying he should be teaching uh, children because his message is so simple and so repetitive. But with God's sovereign perspective here, Isaiah learns that the people's hearts have basically passed the point of no return and that that generation's fate had been sealed. I think about Spurgeon who famously said, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. Isaiah's commission was one of hardening the clay. That's what his work and his role to play was going to be for that generation. Verse 11 says, And I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until cities are devastated, without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Until the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. The Lord's answer to Isaiah's question of how long, how long am I going to have to beat my head against this wall? His his answer is clear. He's going to preach until the land is stripped bare of its people and they are hauled away into exile. The sovereign God who fought for them and brought them into the land is the same sovereign God who will take them out of the land for their revolting against him. But even though, again, even though Isaiah's ministry would be one of deafening and blinding and callousing over the people's hearts, there is an element of hope. If you look at verse 13, he says, Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Judah is like a fallen tree in this image, cut off, severed from its root, destined to return to the dust of the ground. But like a tree that's cut down and not dug up, there will be a holy remnant who will remain. It'll even undergo, it says, additional chastening. That's what seems to be in view there in the middle part of verse 13. But through that chastening judgment, And perseverance, new life, is going to burst forth. This verse reminds me of um, growing up as a young man. My father had a a landscape maintenance company. We lived in Florida, grew up in South Florida. And um, I remember one of many different hurricanes that blew through. And, um, of 
course, a lot of tree damage. And I remember he had one customer had a giant tree in his front yard. And after the storm, we showed up to clean, clean up the property. And this tree had been split right in half. So um, tree guys come, you know, grind it up, chop it down, grind it up, even gro- ground the stump down below grade. And, um, and there was nothing there for about a month. And then once, one Wednesday or Thursday or something, we rolled up to the house. And lo and behold, three or four shoots come out of the ground. This tree, this tree was coming back to life. Against all odds, new life was emerging. And that, that is what the picture is in verse 13. In the world of business, testimonials can be a really powerful tool. Those of you who have businesses and work in marketing, testimonials are a powerful tool that can increase a business's credibility with, um, uh, with the general population in kind of unique ways. And um, what, what are the benefits of a testimonial? Well, the reality is that we're all somewhat skeptical, um, hopefully. <laughs> I uh, don't want to be cynical, but we do need to be skeptical. We certainly don't believe everything we're told, and we ho- I hope we don't believe everything we're sold. However, we're much more inclined to believe other people, um, living, breathing people. This is the reason that certain websites, for example, that pull together customer feedback have, have gained such traction, I think, over the last 15 to 20 years, and why social media has become such a force to be reckoned with. It's kind of like other members of the tribe have tested the business for you and and given you two thumbs up so that way your risk is a little bit reduced. In a similar way, Isaiah 6 functions like a testimonial for this biblical truth that death does not have the last word. Isaiah is saying as he describes his confrontation, his cleansing, and his commission, that there is always, always hope for divine action, even when the odds seem impossibly long. When the king lay dead, and I, he says, was under a sentence of of judgment, and a sacrifice lay dead upon an altar, and a tree lay dead upon the ground, when death seemed to reign supreme and the end all but seemed certain, that was not the case. The death of the king meant the end of an era, but life remained in the root. When I lay dead under a sentence of condemnation, the seraph brought the fire from the altar and declared my iniquity and sin forgiven. And when a sacrifice lay dead upon an altar defiled by the sin it bore, that same sacrifice bought life and cleansing to the one whose place it took. And and, And the testimony of Isaiah is this, what a holy God has done for me and in me, he can do for you and in you. Of course, we on this side of the cross have an even greater testimony that death does not have the final word. Amen? Amen. That's why Paul can stand up as he does in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and mock death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we stood like a dead man under God's holy law, when the fire of God's judgment seemed poised to consume us, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, fulfilled all righteousness, and He took the sting of death upon Himself on our behalf. He gave Himself up for us as a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God so that all who come to Him by faith might be cleansed and brought near like Isaiah was. What we could not do, God did through His Son so that we might have our iniquity taken away and our sin forgiven. And so, death does not have to have the final word for us. 
And the message of the gospel is simply this, what Christ has done for me and in me, he can do in you and for you. There is always hope for God to act even when the lights go out. And so if that's you this morning, if you feel like God has shut the lights off, God has turned away, God has nothing more to do with me, I hear, I stand before you on the authority of the word of God to say that is not true. If you turn, you will enjoy the fullness of his joy, the fullness of forgiveness, the glory of sin covered. And you too can enjoy his eternal presence, both now and in the day to come. What we're going to, what you see as you get into chapter seven and twelve, is how all that's going to unfold, and he's going to show as he gets into these chapters how this greater and perfect Son of David is the one who will accomplish this salvation, not just for Israel and for Judah, but for all the nations. Let's pray, Father. We thank you that you are not a God who turns the lights off and walks away with lost causes. Lord, help us to understand these glorious truths of your holiness, your your transcendence, and your, your purity, and help us also to understand that you are a God who is near to the brokenhearted, to those who would call upon you. Lord, we thank you for this glorious vision that is recorded for us in Isaiah, ministering to us all these years later. We pray that we would be people of hope and trust in you And look to you even when the hour is dark. We know that you stand with us. We thank you for your your glorious word. And this time we've had to study it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.